All right, so in the first part of 3.1, we talked about how to um, convert from exponential, or sorry, to graph exponential function and how to evaluate them. And we talked about graphing based on either just a t-chart or gra graphing based on transformations. So this one says graph f of x and g of x and describe the transformation that yields the graph of g. So if I were to just look at the equations from f of x to g of x, what's the shift? Down two places, right? So when I graph f of x equals 2 to the x, I would do it with the t-chart. I'm going to plug in negative 1, 0, and 1. 2 to the negative 1 becomes 1 half. 2 to the 0 is 1, and 2 to the first is 2. And then I can plot those three points. So negative 1, 1 half, 0, 1, 1, 2. I know my exponential function will bottom out around the um, axis and then increase as it passed x being 1. Now, when I go to graph g of x, I could do the same thing. I could plug in those three points and get straight to points. Or because I already did the work for it and I know the vertical shift is down two, I can simply take each of these points and shift it down two places. And then draw the g of x. So this is my g of x. This is my f of x. And then I said to add on there the domain. So what's the domain? Negative infinity to positive infinity for both? Yes. Okay. How about my range? Okay, good. So for f of x, it's 0 to positive infinity. How about for g of x? Negative 2 to positive infinity. Remember, every time that there's a vertical shift, which is what's happening here, my range is going to change. Or if there's a reflection over the y, I mean over the x, it's going to change. How about, I said to add the horizontal asymptote. What's the horizontal asymptote of the original one? Y equals 0. And then, so this is for the f of x. And then for the g of x, where's my horizontal asymptote? Good. Y equals negative 2. It's shifted down two places. And then the y-intercept. So the y-intercept for f of x is? 0, 1. And for g of x? 0, negative 1. Good. Shifted down two places. Questions on any of that? So, again, whether it be the quiz or the test, be prepared to do something like that without a calculator. You're going to have to be able to plug in those points, okay, and then be able to identify all those parts of your graph. All right, so let's finish the notes for 3.1, and then you'll do the rest of the warm-up tomorrow. So we talked about how to evaluate um, an exponential function. We talked about how to graph it, obviously. Left off at the one-to-one -one property. So the one-to-one -one property says, which is true, for where x is greater than 0, x has to be, or, sorry, a, the base, has to be positive, and it can't be 1 because then it would be a constant function. If those two things are true, then a to the x would equal a to the y if and only if x equals y. So if my bases are the same, then the exponents also have to be equal. And remember, anything raised to the power of 0 is 1. There's no way to compute that. There's no way to figure that out, okay? It's straight memorization. So if you had something like 2 to the third equals 2 to the x, both the bases are the same, and when that happens, you literally can totally ignore the bases and just set your exponents equal to each other, and my x would be 3. Obviously, they get to be a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the general idea behind one-to-one -one property. Standardized tests love these types of problems, right? Uh, you have to change one base to become the other, and then once you get the bases to be the same, the exponents get to equal to each other. So this literally says solve using the one-to-one -one property. It could just say solve, and you have to figure it out that you have to use the one-to-one -one property. So if I look at A, I need to change them so they have the same base, right? Do you change the smaller to become big or the bigger to become small? Bigger to become small. So I rewrite 9 as what? 3 squared. Good. So if 3 to the x minus 2 equals 3 squared, once those bases are the same, I literally ignore them, set my exponents equal to each other, and solve for the variable. These are super easy to check. They should be quick, too. Like if I take that 4 and plug it in, I get 3 to the 4 minus 2, which is 3 squared, and 3 squared is 9. 
Now you've got B. So you've got one half to the x equals 16. There's always more than one way to do these. So you don't have to do them exactly the way I'm doing them. But I tend to try to get rid of the fractions. So if I want to pull 2 to the top, how do I do that? Negative. Good. Make that negative exponent. So that negative x means the negative would push that 2 back down to the bottom. And then 16, can I write 16 as a power of 2? So you can do 4, right? You can do like this is 4 and 4. I could rewrite that as 4 squared, but then I have to rewrite the 2 as well. So if you don't see it, if it's not obvious, use the factor tree, right? If it's 4 and 4, that means it's 2 and 2 and 2 and 2. How many 2s are there? 4. four. So then I get that the exponents can be set equal to each other, and x equals negative 4. Um, you don't have to use negative 4. What do you mean? So if you keep the fraction, if you keep 1 half, and you want to move 16 to the bottom, then it would be negative 4. That's why I was saying you could do this more than one way. Like if I want to keep the fraction, if I want that to be the base, then I can put this as 1 over 16 to the negative 1, and then that is 1 over 2 to the 4th, right? So it would be like this to the negative 4. And either way, you end up with x equals negative 4. It just depends on how you see it. Both work. And then the last one, 6 to the x equals 1. x is what? Zero. Zero. There's no way to figure that out. There's no factor tree you can use to break down. You've got to just have it memorized. Same thing when we get into logs tomorrow. All right, questions on one-to-one -one property. Then we get to E. So E is called the natural base. E is kind of like pi. It's something that's a symbol for a larger number that is irrational. It doesn't end. It doesn't repeat. It is approximated as 2.718281828 and so on and so forth. It doesn't repeat. It doesn't end. Sometimes you'll see it approximated as 2.72, just like pi would be 3.14. Okay, sometimes it'll say use 2.72 for e if it doesn't say that you have to use the e on your calculator so if you take your calculators out every calculator every scientific or graphic calculator has a little button that says e you got to find it so because e is the natural base when we raise it to an x that's a variable now it's an exponential so it's natural and exponential you set it equal to f of x now you've made it a function so f of x equals e to the x is a natural exponential function yep uh, yep yeah. so if you had just e let's just say it said to find e then i would hit second ln because that's where your e to the x lives and make your exponent one so if you do on the graphing calculator, the ln button, which is like the third one from the bottom on the left, above that is your e to the x. If you wanted to know what e to the first was, you would just plug that in, make your exponent 1, and you'd get 2.71828128. That's where it's going to cut off. Everybody found your e? Yeah. So these are not problems. Like, you really won't get too many. Like, maybe if it said, like, e to the first, you would, like, round it without a calculator. But most likely, if it's an e question, you're going to have a calculator. This is the, how they found, this is how it got derived, okay? This is where E comes from. I'll never test you on this or quiz you on this. Just know that it's not like this random number. It's actually something that's found. The, the higher you get in counting numbers, so like if I start with N being 1 and N being 2 and N being 3 and so on and so forth, if I did 1 plus 1 over N to the nth power and you continue to do that, the bigger the number, the closer you get to that 2.7182818827, that and so on, okay? So the higher you get down here, the closer I get to E. There's no way for you to like infinitely get it without a calculator. So you'll just use that E button. So example seven says, use the calculator to evaluate the function f of x equals e to the x at each value of x and then round to three decimal places. So for f of x equals e to the x where x is 4.2, I literally in my calculator hit the E and the exponent will pop up. I type in the 4.2, and I get 66.6863. 
So I'm going to round that to 66.686, three decimal places. So unless it says otherwise or unless we're doing money, which we're going to get to in a minute, do three decimal places. And the homework, there's questions that doesn't say it. Use three decimal places. B is now 125e to the point zero 0.05, and I multiply that times 30. So you can type that all in your calculator, 125e.05 times 30, and I get 560.211. These are real, they should be easy. These are the ones that you're in your calculator do the work. Just be careful on your rounding. Don't make a silly mistake. Questions on those? All right, so then we can graph E because E is really just like 2.7, right? This is just like saying that the base is 2.7. It says use the graphing utility to construct a table of values for the function, then sketch the graph of the function. This doesn't mean go to Y equals, type that in, and then go to table. That's not what you want to do. You want to actually compute the individual parts because that's not going to give you the decimals, right? So I would make my little t-chart, negative 1, 0, 1, and then plug them in. So the first one would be 4, E, negative 1, plus 2. Then 4, E, 0, plus 2. Then 4, E, 1, plus 2. And you could literally type it in just like that. You don't even have to simplify it. So 4 times E negative 1 plus 2, which is 1. This is 10.9, if I round it to the nearest tenth. 4 e to the 2, 29.6. And 4 e to the third, 80.3. Now, obviously, that's not going to fit on my graph the way that it is, so I'm going to adjust it. I'm going to make them each, like, 20 on the Y. 20, 40, 60, 80. God bless you. Negative 1 is 10.9. Oops. 0 is 29.6. And 1 is 80.3. Now, if I just connect what's there, okay, I lose that exponential shape. Remember, this is still an exponential function, which means it's going to come close to without touching my horizontal asymptote. And because this doesn't have a vertical shift, I know my horizontal asymptote is at zero. So all the same characteristics of an exponential function still apply. It's just that the base is like 2.7 on this one. So my domain, negative infinity to positive infinity. My range, zero to positive infinity. My y-intercept is zero and 29.6. Horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. So should you be given a question like this, you'll either have access to your scientific calculator or to a graphing calculator, probably scientific, so you don't cheat and use the actual graph, okay? Or you'll have to fill out the T-chart for me so that I can tell that you did it the other way. All right, compounding interest. So here's the real world application with E and with your exponential functions. Interest is compound in two ways. One is a, a fixed number of times a year. So if I said the interest is earned semi-annually or monthly or daily or weekly or quarterly, anything like that, that's when we use this first one, which is A equals, A stands for the balance of the account, P, which is the money that you put into the account, the principal, times one plus, R, which is the interest rate, over N, number of times per year. All of that raised to the NT, number of times a year times the number of years. And then continuously means that it, it is compounding like a com you couldn't do it fast enough by hand, okay? That a computer is generating the compounding. So compounding means, let's say I compound monthly, right? I put $100 into account and after the first, and I'm earning 10%. After the first month, my balance changes if it's compounding monthly, right? So what's 10% of 100? 10. So at the end of my month, I have $110. And so the next month, I'm earning 10% on that 110. So does, does that make sense? That's how compounding works. So then 100, now I'm earning how much the second month? If it's, hmm? 
Yep, so then it's going up in the increments. Does that make sense? If it's happening daily, then that compounding is happening 365 days in a year. So it's happening more often. The more often you compound, the more money you earn, okay? So if it's yearly, it's gonna be once a year, obviously. Monthly, 12 times in a year. Every time it's compounding, now you're earning interest on your new money, okay? Continuously is the best because it's happening every, like it's happening faster than you can count, okay? So you will, if you're comparing the rates, you'll always earn the most off of a compounding continuously problem. If you were to look at multiple different questions, the answer for that one should always be bigger than the other ones, okay? It'd be pretty close if it was like 365, like if it was daily, it's gonna be pretty close. But the compounding continuously is always gonna be more. So this is good for like a savings account or an interest account, right, in which you're, you put money, you invest it money. This is bad for like a credit card, right? So a credit card that, can, can, that has a high interest rate that compounds continuously means it's charging you more money, okay? So you think about it in two different ways. So compounding a number of times per year, you're using that first one, P times one plus R over N to the NT. And if it's continuous, then it's PERT. P times E, which is why we need the natural base, to the RT. For both of them, your rate has to be in decimal form. So if I told you that the rate was 2.5%, what does that look like in decimal? Good, you gotta move your decimal two places to the left, okay? Honestly, that's the most common mistake people make with the rate problems, okay? If it gives it to you in percent, you've gotta move it two places to the left. So you do that before you plug it into the equation. And then you plug it in and let your calculator do the work. I'm not gonna give you those formulas, so make sure you know them. Yes? Wait, is the rule where um, you, the times it like compounds for the second one, is this like per year? Or should it be like so the T will be year. T is always how many years it's in there, right? The, the thing you don't use for continuous compounding is the number of times a year. There's no N. Okay. That's the difference. Okay, so this one says, find the accumulated value of an investment of $15,000 for two years at an interest rate of 3.2% if the money is A, compounded semi-annually, B, quarterly, C, monthly, D, continuously. So break apart the information that I gave you at the beginning. 15,000 represents which variable? This is your P, this is your principal balance. That's how much money you put in at the beginning. Two years is which variable? T. Interest rate of 3.2% R, and what do I have to do with that? Two places left, so this is 0 0.032. So those three are used for both kinds. But when I look at A, it says semi-annually. How many times a year is that? Semi-annually would be twice a year. So then I'm gonna pull out, let them keep going actually. If it's compounded quarterly, how many times a year? Four times a year. If it's monthly, 12 times a year. And then for D, I'm using PERT. What if I had said daily? What would your N be? 365. If I said weekly? 52. I stumped somebody on a quiz with that once. Don't let that be you, okay? These are, those are things I expect you to know. How many weeks are in a year? How many days are in a year? Okay, probably wouldn't go more than that, but that's, you gotta at least know that stuff. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna plug them in. So into the calculator goes 15,000 times one plus point zero three two over, for the first one it's two, raised to the N, which is two, and T, which is two. And then just type it in. You can actually, because of the, the order of operations, as soon as you put those parentheses in, it's gonna do what's inside first, and division before addition, you don't have to regroup them. So point. Okay, so I'm gonna type it in, 15,000, one plus point zero three two divided by two, raise it to the power of two times two. So I get 15,983, and this is money, so I'm rounding that to the 29 cents. That's A, okay? B says quarterly, so on the calculator, you can actually arrow up 
and hit enter so it duplicates what's there. And then quarterly, which means n is now four, I have to change the four in the denominator here and the four up here. So I get that B is $15,987.31. And then compounded monthly, do that again. Oops. This time be careful because when I type in the 12, I lose the parentheses. I wanna hit second, insert, get my parentheses back, and then 12 times two. And I get 15,990.02. That's C. And then D is PERT. So 15,000 times E to the R, 0 0.32 times T, which is 2. And I get 15,991.39.